You're watching Your Finance TV. I'm Mehdi Sunderji, and here with Jeffrey Hughes, founder of Alpha Insights. Jeff published his weekly playbook on Sunday, which can be found on Substack. And the address is hugeinsights.substack.com. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe to Your Finance TV to stay on top of our content. Jeff, welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I did indeed. And thanks again for having me on the show, Mehdi. Absolutely. So this market seems a little bit like a deer in headlights with uh, news flow not really having any particular effect on the bulls and the bears. Maybe they're just uh, becoming a bit of a wash. I don't know how to sort of see this anymore. But uh, as always, why don't we kick off with your top down? Actually, that sounded a little bit wrong, Jeff, but uh, let's let's kick it off. Well, obviously, there was a lot of drama over the weekend with respect to geopolitics in Russia. Uh, it seemed to be quite the thing to tweet on that over the weekend. I might have got something on order of 200 tweets from people, uh, you know, claiming to have some sort of expert insight on what was happening. And uh, it doesn't look like it was much of a market event, if any event at all. Um, you know, it looks like an internal squabble. We don't really have any insights to, um, you know, convey that are uh, unique. And so we'll just kind of leave it at that. But uh, the market did not react yesterday. Uh, and, you um, you know, when I think about uh, what happened last week, uh, you know, we look at the price action as being the beginning of a turning point in the market, right? Uh, we saw the S&P down about 1.37%. Uh, it was the first down week in, in I think, three or four. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of broke that cycle of, of new highs, right, on a weekly basis. But what, in my mind, was really important was the weekly close and the candle formation, those who are familiar with Japanese candlestick charting will recognize this term, a bearish harami candlestick uh, formed on a weekly basis. That's an inside week uh, in, in kind of technical parlance, right? And the last time that we saw an inside week, believe it or not, was December of 2008. And what followed was a 30% decline into the March 6, 2009 lows. So um, I think that that's a pretty important uh, a piece of, of market data that we got on Friday. Uh, that being said, um, you know, our view is that, you know, we were in the process of completing a counter trend advance at primary wave two degree of trend. Uh, and if Friday, June 16th did mark the terminal point of that wave, then we are rolling over into primary wave three down. And primary wave three down should carry the market to new bear market lows uh, in the not too distant future. As long as that June 16th high in the S&P 500 holds, then we are in primary wave three down as we speak. And, uh, you know, that being said, we continue to expect lower bear market lows. And we are advising our clients to remain patient, minimize net equity exposure and maximize cash reserves. Uh, as of Friday's close, we had uh, three and six month T bills paying 5.4%. We think that's a fat pitch, and we would advise uh, investors to take advantage of it right now. Get paid to wait risk free. Patience and 5.4%. It sounds like a decent combination. Um, Jeff, we haven't seen this one in a while the SP 500 cycle composite uh, from our friends at Ned Davis. Yeah, you know, we haven't been uh, publishing this for a, a while. I, we, we do occasionally follow uh, the cycle composite, which uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it, is a, an aggregation on an equal weight basis of three cycles, the one-year seasonal cycle, the four-year presidential cycle, and the 10-year decennial cycle. Uh, this cycle uh, composite data tends to be most effective in year one and year four of the presidential cycle. That's our, our um, you know, experience working with it. And so really for the past couple of years, we haven't paid a lot of attention to it, but we continue to monitor it. And so um, what I would tell you is that um, we did get a pretty sharp deviation from the expected path of the S&P 500 in the first quarter, a sharp up deviation and then a sharp downward deviation. But within the second quarter, we actually saw uh, the actual path of the S&P 500 start to synchronize or resynchronize with 
the expected path based on the cycle composite. And we are now reaching kind of the peak of that expected path, albeit the year-to-date total return of the S&P 500 has exceeded what the cycle composites forecast would have said by some 600 basis points. So, you know, we overshot and uh, the cycle composite is slated to peak in early July. And just given the deviations that we've seen and where we are in the wave count with our Elliott work, uh, we believe that we probably peaked a little ahead of the expected path, but the expected path is for a decline overall in the S&P 500 from early July into late November. And if the June 16th peak uh, just front ran it by a couple of weeks, then we're probably in that process of decline. So, you know, what we want to do is we want to be uh, aware of where the cycle composites expected path is, is going to take us and what the implications are for uh, equity markets. And that would be uh, to the downside. So, Jeff, the quality of this rally has really been under a microscope over the last several weeks and months. Um, are we still not seeing this broad-based adoption? Well, it's pretty clear that the broad stock market peaked on February 2nd. Um, I can I can list off, you know, a, a long list of, of broad market indexes uh, that peaked well um, ahead of where the S&P and the NASDAQ uh, composite and NASDAQ 100 index have taken us since. And, you know, we can look back to, you know, say the Dow Jones composite, which is the industrials, the transports and the utilities. Um, the Dow actually peaked back on December 13th. It, that was the recovery high. Transports were, I think, in um, late January and utilities uh, maybe in February with the broad market. But we just look at, say, the S&P equal weight. It peaked on February 2nd. Uh, with the, the actual S&P, the problem is the S&P and the NASDAQ composite and the NASDAQ 100 have all carried to new highs. None of these secondary indexes uh, have, like the, the Russell 2000, the value line, arithmetic and geometric. Uh, the uh, New York Stock Exchange composite, um, these broad, you know, non-heavy um, tech weighted indexes, you know, that are not market capitalization weighted, they all peaked five months ago. And so the question that I think you have to ask yourself is, if this is a new bull market, why hasn't the broad market followed the major averages uh, to new highs, right? And, uh, you know, take a look at, for example, the Wisdom Tree 4,500. That's the 4,500 stocks after the S&P 500, okay? You know, the mid cap 400, the small cap 600, the Russell 2000, none of these indexes have made new post-February highs. And so I think the answer to that question is because we're not in a new bull market. What we saw was a, um, uh, a, a narrative-driven uh, advance that extended uh, as investors became beguiled by what has turned out to be a, you know, hysterical response to the possibility that artificial intelligence is going to, you know, uh, dramatically increase CapEx spending and investment in technology over the coming years. But, you know, I don't think that there's any evidence to support that other than conjecture at this point. And so, you know, it, it's our view that, you know, everything that we've seen uh, in terms of the major, major averages extending to new highs has been driven by a handful of stocks that have experienced dramatic multiple expansion uh, over the last three months, not fundamental earnings and revenue growth. In fact, you know, kind of the, the poster child for AI is NVIDIA, right? Because they raised their second quarter guidance from 7 billion to 11 billion. They haven't produced 11 billion yet. They still need to, you know, uh, to, to prove that out, right? Um, but what we saw was a 13% year over year decline in revenues as, as presented in the first quarter. And so these companies are not seeing growth over the last year. And what we have is we have improved expectations for future growth. I'm a little um, suspicious of that. You know, I'm doubtful that they're going to be able to uh, deliver. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Let's put it that way. 
Well, one of the follow-ons from something not delivering is volatility. Um, let's have, you know, we just haven't seen any of the volatility that we really expected. The VIX has also been making some new lows. Are you seeing any signs or signals that could uh, signal a change? I am. And, you know, let's just back up one second and explain why volatility has been um, so so non-existent, right? Um, it's our view that it's been artificially suppressed by, you know, really the options market itself. I mean, the, the move to zero days to expiration have really created such a situation where people are gambling one day to the next on the price moves of, of really these seven magnificent seven stocks that have been driving the major averages, right? And as a result, it's forced options market makers to buy more stock in order to hedge their books, something called a gamma squeeze. And we talked about this in our uh, recent uh, conversation with uh, Jim Struger. And uh, I know, as you mentioned earlier, that is a video that got a lot of attention for those who have not seen it. It's uh, still, um, I think it's got a long shelf life. So you can probably still find that on your finance TV and take a look. But the bottom line is this, <clears throat> if we look at the momentum of the VIX's decline, it is looking as though it's losing downside momentum. In fact, we saw a positive divergence in that momentum study, uh, which means basically as the VIX is making lower lows, our momentum study is making higher lows. And that positive divergence tends to signal a change, okay? And historically, that change has resulted in a major trend change in the underlying, the VIX itself. And so our suspicion is that the VIX is finding its lows here and uh, will indeed uh, embark on a new course. And that course should probably be sharply to the upside. And I believe that it will coincide with the decline in the major averages, which we believe have peaked. Let's talk technical, shall we? Mm -hmm. I know you touched on some of the levels in your uh, opening statements, but uh, looking at the short-term Elliott Way view, how are things lining up here? Well, you know, it looks to us again like this um, bear market rally, this counter trend advance off the October lows terminated on June 16th. And the level it terminated in was 44.48. So as long as the market holds below 44.48, that June 16th high, then we believe primary wave two of this five wave impulse uh, pattern, which will ultimately trace out cycle wave A of an ABC corrective waveform at super cycle degree of trend has basically peaked out at 4448. What we've seen since is the very early initial uh, subdivisions of primary wave three down. Primary wave three down should carry the S&P 500 index to new bear market lows. Our minimum target for primary wave three down is S&P 2750. It could go lower than that. But once we complete that primary wave three uh, low, uh, we expect a counter trend advance that's very likely to be more of a lateral consolidation than a large um, extended move up like we've seen thus far uh, in this current advance off the October lows. Um, we tend to see something in Elliott's uh, work that's known as the alternation of, uh, of waves. So wave two and wave four, which are counter trend interruptions within an impulse uh, pattern, um, they tend to um, kind of do the opposite of one another. In other words, if one is, is sharp and extended, the other one will be uh, subdued and lateral. And so we would expect wave four to be a lateral consolidation before we get the final wave five plunge down to complete cycle wave A. That level in our view is likely to occur around S&P 2250. And the way we get there is a few ways, basically. We use three methods. We use some Fibonacci extensions uh, and uh, retracements. And that happens to be a level where, you know, we retrace a Fibonacci 61.8% of the entire advance off the 2009 low into the January 2022 high. That level also coincides with the 200 month moving average and a previous fourth wave extreme, which is a common retracement point that tends to hold as support. So, you know, between those three metrics, uh, we believe it's a high probability that 2250 will hold as support for cycle wave A down. Cycle wave A will be followed by cycle wave B, which will be a counter trend advance 
uh, of some significant magnitude, our expectation is a minimum 50% retracement, uh, but it could be anywhere between one third and two thirds. And once we complete cycle wave B, cycle wave C will carry to new and lower bear market lows. Our minimum expectation for cycle wave C to the downside and super cycle wave four at large is 1400 on the S&P 500. But I think it's possible we could get even lower than that. Uh, my suspicion is if we retrace the, the full 78.6% um, retracement, that will carry the market all the way down to about 1000, give or take on the S&P 500, which actually connects with a long-term trend line that dates all the way back to the 1932 low. And that is the super cycle that we're correcting. And we believe it makes sense to achieve that. So it's food for thought at this point. We don't have an official projection, but that just kind of puts out there what we could expect in kind of a worst case scenario. The real question is how long is this going to take? And a lot of people who are looking at bear markets uh, are looking at cyclical bear markets dating back the last 40 or 50 years, maybe in just post-World War II history. And they don't understand that we haven't seen a super cycle degree bear market since the 1929 to 1932 Great Depression event. That 29 to 32 stock market collapse is probably more on order of what we should expect. Only because wave two only took three years back in super cycle wave two, we would expect it to take longer. We would expect it to be more drawn out. We're expecting a decade of, of bear market activity. And that's not to say that there won't be tradable rallies. Okay, certainly we saw a tradable rally off the October low. That, in my mind, carried much further than we originally expected, right? But, um, you know, we should see a, a tremendous opportunity to trade cycle wave B uh, for, you know, dramatic profits. And so we're really holding out for the end of cycle wave A to reposition long to capture that cycle wave B retracement, which we think could be you know, pretty, pretty powerful. But this is gonna be an epic plunge uh, to the downside and it could take some, somewhere between you know, years and decades, right? And we're thinking 10 years really is kind of a working hypothesis. Jeff, can I just ask, you've talked about your short term view and you've also discussed the super cycle. We had the highs on June the 16th. If we were to surpass those highs, would that have an impact on the super cycle or purely on the short term? The super cycle will still stay intact. Yeah, the super cycle is intact. Um, it would have an, an impact on the short term, right? So let's just say that we surpassed that, that 44, 48 level that we saw on June 16th. If that were to occur the next most likely uh, target would be the 78.6% retracement of primary wave one down. That would carry to about S&P 4534. Um, if we sustained above that level, I would be suspicious of my larger degree hypothesis, okay? Um, where I would get confirmation about primary wave three to the downside would come in at 4299 on the S&P. If we broke 4299, that would very strongly support the notion that primary wave three down is underway. Once we break below 4186 on a weekly closing basis, that will confirm it. And I think that will close the door on primary wave two up and any bull case uh, going forward. If the market were to make a new high, uh, then what would happen is we would suggest that the October low was a fourth wave low and that you know, the advance off the, uh, the, the COVID crash lows of March uh, 2020 uh, began a, a new uh, fifth uh, primary wave five of cycle wave five of super cycle wave three. And, and that we are really just completed the fourth wave of that. So the market would move to new highs. And we'd have some projections on that. I think that's a very low probability at this juncture. Um, based on a lot of the research that we're doing, um, we see very little prospect of new all-time highs uh, in the future of the S&P 500. Got it. Thank you for that. 
Um, something we haven't looked at in the last couple of weeks, the S&P 500 internals. Uh, how are they looking? Well, honestly, they're crashing. You know, um, we saw an utter collapse in, in breadth. Uh, you know, the percent of net advancing issues in the S&P 500 last week. But the five-week moving average turned down sharply as well and has left a negative divergence in place. And, you know, what that means is that, you know, the, uh, the, the expansion of breadth was more significant at the February 2nd high than it was at the most recent high on June 16th. And so, you know, that, again, gives a lot of credibility to our initial uh, suspicion that you know the broad market topped back on um, uh, February second, and that this has really just been um, a, a extension rally led by a handful of stocks. Now, if we look at momentum, momentum has also put in a uh, a lower high, a, a negative divergence. A negative mo- uh, negative momentum divergences often precede a change in in trend, and so you know we're talking about the recovery highs, not new highs, right? And <clears throat> what we're seeing is um, a downturn in momentum at this point on the five-week RSI oscillator. Uh, it's still holding above the median line right now. Once we cross below the median line, that will confirm that primary wave three is accelerating to the downside. And again, you know, we also look at up-down volume. And again, this is just the S&P 500, not the broader market. But S&P 500 up volume was a mere 15% of total volume last week. And in fact, we saw the five week moving average of up to down uh, volume ratio uh, tick down to, I believe 2.3 from 2.4 a week ago. You know, usually when the market is breaking out to uh, new highs and and accelerating into a bull market, you'll see that up down ratio of, of advancing to declining volume in the five to six, seven, eight, nine times. I mean, we're at 2.3 times. That's not an exciting level. And uh, honestly, it looks like it's turning down lower. <clears throat> would, would it be fair to say that investors are still pretty optimistic in all of this? It'd be absolutely fair to say that. And, and one other thing it would be fair to say is that they're more optimistic today than they were at the uh, peak in uh, February of, uh, of this year. So, you know, when we saw the broad market peak on February 2nd, Investors were somewhat more optimistic. Today, they're more optimistic about that, yet fewer stocks are going up. And so, you know, it leads us to believe that this is a false optimism, right? It's a, it's a, it's a second wave, and second waves tend to retrace so much of the first wave down that it actually convinces market participants that the bull market is here to stay, that it's back, right? It's it's designed, second waves are designed to draw investors back into the market and reaccelerate the optimism that existed at the bull market peak. And in many respects, um, optimism is greater today than it was at the all-time highs on, on a variety of measures. And so, you know, I think at this point in time, uh, looking at the name index of the National Association of Active Investment Managers, you know, we're at 83%. Uh, that's pretty fully invested, down from ninety uh, percent recently, but an uptick from last week, believe it or not, despite the fact that we saw you know a down week in the s and p um, If we look at the AAII, this is the individual investors. This is a notoriously bearish cohort to begin with. Well, we're looking at a bull bear spread of fifteen percent on the positive side. That's up from forty two percent on the negative side back at the October lows. But it's down slightly from 22.5% where we were two weeks ago. And so, you know, it's come in some, but still sharply more uh, optimistic today than we saw uh, looking back to October of uh, 2022. Let's dive into some sectors, Jeff. Uh, How was last week? Any standouts that you want to run through? Well, I think it's noteworthy to just point out that healthcare was the only sector that was positive. It was only up a quarter of a percentage point. The average stock was down 2.5%. The S&P, as I mentioned earlier, was down 1.37%. Um, you know, REITs were the worst performer. They were down almost 4% last week. Uh, but pretty much, um, you know, the vast majority of cyclical sectors were negative 
uh, last week and, and underperformed the market. Whereas, you know, communication services, discretionary and staples were outperformers relative to the market. Uh, that being said, they were all negative. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, wrap up with a conversation about the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. There seems to be a rotation internally there. Of these seven stocks, um, it's usually NVIDIA and Tesla and Microsoft that are leading, uh, as well as Meta. Uh, last week, it was Amazon, Apple, and Meta that were on that were positive. Google, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Microsoft were all negative. But all of these stocks outperformed the average stock in the S&P 500. So, you know, the idea that we're getting, you know, a broadening out in the market and that, you know, tech's rolling over and leadership is shifting to industrials. Well, that's a great narrative, but it doesn't play out. OK, the average stock is still underperforming the Magnificent Seven across the board. And despite the pullback that we've seen in tech, the leadership continues to be the Magnificent Seven. Fantastic. And Jeff, I just want to clarify for our viewers, you are still publishing your weekly longs and shorts, your top picks for the week, every week, week in, week out. And they can be found on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com. So I would urge you all to go check it out. Jeff, thank you as always for sharing your thoughts from Alpha Insights. It's always a mind-boggling experience. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I learn something new every single week. It's phenomenal. So uh, thank you for that. Pleasure to be here. And everyone watching, good luck investing.